Okay. So, the first topic we will start with is uh, complex analysis of functions of a single complex variable and I am going to assume that all of you already have a little bit of preliminary information on this or knowledge about it. So, it will be more in the nature of recapitulation. So, recall that we define a complex variable. z as x plus i y and x and y are elements of the real number line. Okay. Now, this uh, complex plane the x y plane is called the complex plane and we are going to talk about functions which are analytic functions in a specific sense of this combination x plus i y. Okay. The reason this is uh, emphasized is because x and y are linearly independent of each other and of course, if you have an arbitrary function of x and y there is no reason it should be a function only of a particular combination of x and y. In this case it is a combination is x plus i y. Remember that this uh, thing z star x minus i y is linearly independent of z. So, the whole thing about analytic functions is simply that you have a function of x and y which is a function of the combination x plus i y and does not involve the combination x minus i y. So, that is roughly speaking what an analytic function is we will make this idea much more precise. Okay. But before we do that I would like to introduce the idea of stereographic projection because on the x y plane Unlike the case of a real variable x where it can tend to either plus infinity or minus infinity on this side and likewise for y in the complex plane there are actually an infinite number of directions in which you can tend to infinity along any ray okay, in any direction whatsoever. Now, that is a little uncomfortable because we seem to have many many points at infinity so to speak. So, the standard trick is to try and put this idea of infinity on a footing which is more or less the same as that of any finite point and that is done by compactifying this space. In other words imagine this plane is a huge pancake and then you take that pancake and lift it up and so it is ends together. So, it becomes the surface of a sphere and this will then be our model for the complex plane the extended complex plane. To make this precise one does what is called a stereographic projection. stereographic projection which is you take a unit sphere that is the equator and the plane of this equator is going to be our complex plane z plane. So, on this sphere you have these axes this comes out of the board this is what I call the y direction in the x y plane. So, this is the complex plane the complex z plane this is a unit sphere it is called unit radius and on this sphere on this plane the coordinates are x and y x coming out here and y going in that direction. And on this sphere, the unit sphere, I would like to have coordinates, there are three coordinates, but they satisfy a constraint because the sums of the squares of these three coordinates will become unity because it is a unit sphere. So, let us call those coordinates xi 1, xi 2, and xi 3. So, on the sphere, and this sphere I call S. On S, the coordinates are xi 1, xi 2, and xi 3 where xi 1 is in the x direction, xi 2 is in the y direction and xi 3 is in what would have been the z direction, but I am going to reserve z for the combination x plus i y in the third direction up here. Now, what are these uh, things actually in terms of angular coordinates on this sphere? Well, on that sphere unit sphere I can define a polar angle theta which is the co-latitude and a longitude phi an azimuthal angle phi. Then of course, xi 1 as you are all aware is sin theta 
cos phi, this is sin theta, sin phi and this is cos theta. Okay. Those are just spherical polar coordinates on this plane or on this sphere. Okay. Now, the idea of the stereographic projection is that you take this point the north pole this and this one is the south pole here at the other end that is the origin. You take this north pole and draw a line to any point on this plane like this for instance. This point here the line joining the point of projection to this point intersects this sphere S at one point and you associate this point with that point in the complex plane. Okay. And now you can see that this is going to be a mapping from the complex plane to the surface of this sphere because for every point in this complex plane there exists one point on the sphere. It is immediately clear here that all points lying within the unit circle in the complex plane are going to be mapped or are mapped from points in the southern hemisphere of this Riemann sphere and all points outside the unit circle like this for instance are mapped or are mapped from points in the northern hemisphere of this sphere. Okay. The equator of this sphere is the unit circle in the complex plane, the circle on which mod z is equal to 1. The south pole is mapped into the origin here and the origin in the complex plane is mapped into the south pole on the Riemann sphere. Okay. Now, what we need are equations which connect the coordinates xi 1, xi 2, xi 3 to the coordinates x and y on the plane. Remember there are only two independent coordinates because xi 1 squared plus xi 2 squared plus xi 3 squared is equal to 1. So, there is a constraint between them. And just as you have x and y are independent, similarly, two out of these three are independent coordinates. Now, the coordinate, the uh, actual uh, co mapping from one to the other is fairly easy to see. Look at it for an example in the intersection in this xi 3, xi 2 plane. Look at, look at it for a minute, then it looks like this. And what you are doing is to map in this fashion that was y. So, this is the y coordinate, but in the same direction on the Riemann sphere you are calling it xi 2 and you are calling this coordinate here xi 3 and this is of course, 1 on this side that is the origin. Okay. And now, by similarity of triangles it is immediately clear that this divided by the whole length on that side is equal to this divided by the whole length out here. So, it immediately follows that y or rather xi 2 divided by y that is this over that on this side is equal to on this side what should I write? Well, this portion that is 1 minus xi 3 divided by 1 on that side, right. So, this is to this as this is to this entire length, okay. So, that is the equation that immediately tells us right away that y equal to xi 2 over 1 minus xi 3. Okay. And if you have done this in this plane here, the intersection of this line with this line, the plane formed by these two lines, then you would have immediately got x equal to xi 1 over 1 minus xi 3. Okay. On the complex plane, okay. now you could go back and write xi 1, xi 2, etcetera in terms of these fellows and then you can ask what does this mapping actually look like. It is easy to see that for instance x equal to xi 1. So, for xi 1 I write sin theta cos phi and for xi 3 it is 1 minus cos theta and then go to half angles and then it immediately becomes clear that this is equal to cot theta over 2 
cos phi y equal to cot theta over 2 sin phi. So, it means that z is equal to e to the i phi cot theta over 2. z star is e to the minus i phi cot theta over 2, where theta and phi are the polar and azimuthal angles on this sphere. By the way, this sphere S, this thing here is called the Riemann sphere. You could ask what are the reverse mappings? Well, you need to exploit the fact that xi 1 squared plus xi 2 squared plus xi 3 squared is equal to 1 and then it is not hard to see that the reverse mappings to these two oh by the way I should complete this by writing uh, this implies that z equal to xi 1 plus i xi 2 over 1 minus xi 3 z star xi 1 minus i xi 2 over 1 minus xi 3. And what are the reverse mappings? It is not hard to see directly from here that xi 1 is 2 x divided by x squared plus y squared plus 1, xi 2 is 2 y divided by x squared plus y squared plus 1 and xi 3 is equal to x squared plus y squared plus 1 divided by minus 1. which you could of course also write as 2 x that is z plus z star divided by mod z whole square plus 1. This is equal to z minus z star over i times mod z square plus 1 and this guy is mod z squared minus 1 over mod z squared plus 1. So, there is a one to one mapping between the complex plane and the Riemann sphere. Okay. The question is what is the point n going to get mapped into under this map. Okay. It is immediately geometrically clear immediately that as I get closer and closer here the point in the complex plane is going further and further away. Okay. So, it is evident that no matter which direction you approach n in you are going to be hitting infinity along some ray in the complex plane, but all those points are getting mapped onto n. Okay. So, I can call n the point at infinity right. In fact, I can call it infinity I denote it by infinity and what this does is to bring infinity to a status which is similar to that of any finite point in the complex plane. Okay. So, very often I am going to denote the complex plane by z this is all this is all this is a set of all values of z such that the modulus of z is finite and if I include the point at infinity I am going to call it the extended complex plane and very often I am going to denote c tilde equal to the extended which includes the point at infinity. Okay. But the Riemann sphere provides me with a model for the extended complex plane. Okay. Is this clear that it is geometrically obvious intuitively that this n now represents the point at infinity. So, that is why very often in complex analysis I will loosely say that there is just one point at infinity this infinity. I might tend to it in different directions I do not care, but what I mean by that is this point here this point n. Okay. So, this compactification of this complex plane enables you to extend it to include the point at infinity puts it on the same footing as anything else and then of course, we can do ca calculus on it very uh, rigorously without worrying about this infinity what this infinity is. 
one could ask on this uh, point, on this sphere, do I have a notion of distance on this sphere? Well, there are many ways of defining distance on it. One of them would be to define a great circle distance. Now, what is a great circle distance between any two points on the surface of a sphere? You pretend that the one of the points is the north pole and then you look for the distance along the longitude to the second point and that is the geodesic distance, the shortest distance lying on the sphere. You could also define distance in this case as if I have two points z1 and z2 in the complex plane, in the plane here, then z1 minus z2 modulus is what I would call the distance between these two points on the complex plane. Okay. On the other hand, I could ask what is the distance, corresponding distance on this sphere? Well, it would be the chordal distance between these two points. So, I draw a chord through this hollow sphere from one point to the other and calculate what that distance is when the two points on the complex plane are z1 and z2. And then a little bit of algebra shows you that this distance, chordal distance, between z1 and z2, let us call it d of z1, z2, this is equal to twice, turns out to be twice modulus z1 z2 divided by square root of mod z1 squared plus 1. z2 squared plus 1 turns out to be this quantity, a little bit of algebra. You can substitute from these uh, expressions and then you end up with this expression for the distance. Okay. Notice the presence of these two denominators here. Okay. Now, what does that do? That makes the distance between any points on the sphere finite including point the point at infinity okay. because you can see now that this satisfies all the properties you need of a distance function. For instance, d of z1, z2 equal to 0 if and only if z1 equal to z2. There is no other way this distance can vanish. Okay. And then you know that this distance d of z1, z2 in general is non-negative. That is obvious from here and the distance from any point to any other point satisfies the triangle inequality z1, z3 is less than equal to d of z1, z2 plus d of z2, z3. And this is also, well, d of z2, z1 is equal to this, it is symmetric under the interchange of these two points. So, the, this uh, distance as defined here satisfies all the requirements that you make of what you call a distance function. Okay. So, it is a respectable distance function satisfies the triangle inequality and so on. Now, what does it mean to say the distance to the point at infinity? Well, d of z infinity equal to, so set z1 equal to z and z2 equal to infinity then of course in the limit when z2 goes to infinity it's all this is all that contributes and that cancels against the z2 here and you immediately get 2 divided by square root of mod z square plus 1 okay. so what's the distance between the origin and the point at infinity the caudal distance it's 2 and that is in fact the caudal distance between the south pole and the north pole on the sphere, it is just the diameter of the sphere. So, this uh, thing here is extremely useful, the idea of this caudal distance and one can make a lot of progress using this. Okay. We are not going to do much more with this, but simply to point out here that there exists such a distance, notion of distance and it has got an interesting structure. We do, but I'm, I am going to talk about it in a problem set or something like that. Yeah, it is useful. Okay, now let us get to analytic functions and let us see what we mean by an analytic function. So, very roughly speaking, an analytic function in some region 
So, we have a function f of x and y let us call it and I said it should be a function of z is an analytic function I am going to use this term analytic and later on I will qualify it in certain ways. It is analytic in some region in this complex plane if it satisfies a couple of relations. If this f of z is uh, u of x comma y plus i times b of x comma y where u and v are the real and imaginary parts of this function then this is analytic analytic hmm, if the Cauchy Riemann conditions are satisfied ok. I am not going to prove the Cauchy Riemann conditions here it is fairly straightforward to do it. But I would like you to tell me re recall what these re conditions are and then we will try to interpret them analytic if the Cauchy Riemann conditions are satisfied. What are these conditions? Yeah, the conditions are delta u over delta x equal to delta v over delta y, delta u over delta y to minus delta v over delta x. Okay. So, right away you see that an analytic function must have partial derivatives first order partial derivatives of the first order with respect to both x and y both the real and imaginary parts ok. So, that is a prerequisite you need those partial derivatives and they should be continuous and that is more or less all that you need for a function to be analytic. But what it really means these conditions what it really means is that this thing here as I said is not a function of the other linearly independent combination. It is a function of x and y, but it is a function of the combination x plus i y with no reference to x minus i y. So, we could say that an analytic function is something for which delta f over delta z star equal to 0 say that okay. no dependence on uh, z star at all. So, it is uh, by the way. Um, we know that uh, you have to tell me what is x in terms of z and z star it is this y is z minus z star over 2 y ok. Just as z is x plus i y and z star is x minus i y I invert those these are the other inverse relations. Now, what would this imply now I can take the z star write it as x minus i y and then use the chain rule of differentiation. So, this would imply that delta f over delta x minus i delta f over delta y equal to 0 okay. and now you put f equal to u plus i v and equate real and imaginary parts and you get the Cauchy Riemann conditions ok. So, a quick way of asking what is an analytic function is to see if this function is nice and smooth has first order derivatives and so on and then check whether it has any dependence on z star or not. And if it does not and you can express it purely as a function of z then you say it is analytic you do not have to check these conditions out each time. Is this an analytic function? I would not even call it f of z I will just call it f is that an analytic function? No because you see the by the way this immediately tells you that you cannot have a function it is analytic in a certain region if in that entire region it has no imaginary part at all if it is purely real or if it is purely imaginary with the real part being identically 0 or the imaginary part being identically 0 in a whole region you cannot be analytic hmm? and that is indeed true because x is z plus z star over 2 and it involves z star of course right. So, it cannot be an analytic function. How about y? Not an analytic function. How about you know sometimes you write this as uh, r e to the i theta by the way this theta is not the same as that. So, let us get rid of this you write it in polar form in this fashion where r is equal to square root of x squared plus y squared and this theta is tan inverse y over x. Okay. 
write it in this form. So, tell me is R an analytic function? How do you write R in terms of z and z star? Well, R squared is x squared plus y squared, right? So, it is z z star. So, this is R is equal to mod z and that is not an analytic function it is got this dependence here. Hmm? What about theta? Is theta an analytic function? Tan inverse y over x now I write y and x in terms of this. Hmm? How do I write theta in terms of z in terms of z and z star? Well z star is r e to the minus i theta. So, if I divide z by z star the r cancels out and I get e to the 2 i theta right. So, this is equal to 1 over 2 i log z over z star. Does that involve z star? So, can it be an analytic function? No, not an analytic function. Hmm? x is not, y is not, r is not, theta is not and so on. So, analytic functions have to have very specific structures not every function is analytic. Hmm? Is this an analytic function? Well, let me give you let us let us go ahead let me give you a few more example as we, uh, examples as we go along. But one consequence of what this these equations tell us one consequence is immediately that d 2 u over d x 2 plus del squared u over delta y square equal to 0 and that is also true for v. Okay. So, in the region in which some function f of z with real part u and imaginary part v in the region in which this function is analytic the real part and the imaginary part separately satisfy Laplace's equation in two dimensions. What do you call functions which satisfy Laplace's equation? Harmonic. harmonic functions. So, the real and imaginary parts of an analytic function are harmonic functions. Okay. Now, this set of equations is telling you in some sense that if you give me the real part, the imaginary part is more or less determined by in principle solving the Cauchy Riemann conditions. Okay. So, what an analytic function is, is like this suppose u is harmonic in this region in the complex plane and v is harmonic in this region in the complex plane. Then u plus i v is guaranteed to be an analytic function in the intersection of these two regions. Okay. In that intersection region both u and v are harmonic functions and they can be the real and analytic uh, imaginary parts of an analytic function. Okay. So, in that sense if you solve the Cauchy Riemann conditions given u you can find v, but you have to specify the region you have to specify the region in which things are analytic. Hmm? And now let me jump a little bit and explain that if a function is analytic in the whole of the finite complex plane it is called an entire function. Hmm? If these conditions are satisfied in the whole of the complex plane for all mod z less than infinity then f of z is an entire function. lots of examples of entire functions. Is this an how about this? Is that an entire function? Yes or no? Yes, yes it satisfies the Cauchy Riemann conditions for all z all finite z. How about this? 
Do you think it satisfies? Well, you got to write z as x plus i, but more simply this function is differentiable and it is clear that it does not involve z star. So, it is very much analytic. You can in principle write x plus i y whole squared and then you differentiate the real part imaginary parts. So, see if they check um, satisfy Cauchy Riemann, they certainly do. So, that is an entire function. How about this? Is that an entire function? Yes, certainly, most certainly. How about uh, f of z equal to p n of z, some polynomial of, our, of degree n? Is that an entire function? Yes. Arbitrary polynomial? Yes, yes certainly, it is an entire function. How about uh, f of z equal to e to the power z. Do you think that is an entire function? Yes. Well, we need to write the definition of e to the z in terms of a power series and then ask whether that series is valid for all z or not. Is that true or false? Is the series for what is the definition of e to the z by the way? For what z is this valid? It less than one. All finite z. Mod z less than one. All finite z. So is e to the z an entire function? Yes. yes. E to the minus z? Yes. It all it does is put a minus one to the end. It doesn't do anything huh? inside. How about e to the z plus e to the minus z divided by two? Yes. So, what do you call that by the way? Cosh. That is entire. So, e to the z, e to the minus z, cosh z. What about sin hyperbolic z, sinh z? Is that an entire function? Yes. Yes, indeed. It is only the odd part of this series and the other thing is the even part. So, the function itself is an entire function, it is odd part, it is even part, they are all entire functions, right. How about sin z or cos z? Do you think that is an entire function? Can you write it as exponentials? Plus yeah, e to the minus iz, right. It is e to the iz plus e to the minus iz over 2 and sin z z is an arbitrary complex number by the way. Hmm? Sin and sin hyperbolic, cos and cos hyperbolic, they are all the same function. I mean essentially they are analytic continuations of each other. So, regard all these functions are defined by power series and as the argument of the power series being a complex variable z. That is the correct way to define look at all these functions. Hmm? All these are entire functions. Everything is an entire function. How about tan z? Well, that is that's not, it's not immediately clear at all. It is not clear that it is an entire function. Certainly, it is singular at some points it blows up, right. So, that is not entire. How about z to negative powers? They blow up at infinity, right, at, at 0, at z equal to 0. So, those are not entire functions. Polynomials, yes, but rational functions, no, because you have places where the function blows up, right. Now, there is a theorem called Liouville's theorem which says that if a function has no singularity everywhere, it is analytic everywhere in the extended complex plane, namely at all points on the Riemann sphere, then it must necessarily be a constant. There is no other function, no other function at all. So, if you have a function that is entire and at infinity it is not singular but continues to obey the Cauchy-Riemann conditions, then that function must be a constant, trivial constant. 
So, what is the conclusion immediately for all these functions? For all these normal entire functions, these are not constants, they are functions of z, non trivial functions, but they are entire. So, the conclusion is they cannot satisfy the Cauchy Riemann conditions at the point at infinity, they must be singular at infinity, hmm? they must be singular at infinity. So, all these functions that is why I was very careful to write mod z less than infinity because at infinity there are singularities. Hmm? and we will come to what kind of singularities they are etcetera. In these cases they are all what are called essential singularities. Okay. Now, the same thing goes through for this. This is a monomial, you have an arbitrary polynomial here, but these things blow up at the point at infinity. They have singularities at infinity, those would be called poles of various kinds. Okay. So, we will classify these singularities quickly, but the fact is that you cannot have an entire function which continues to be analytic at infinity without being a constant, it has to be a constant. But these are lots of examples here, all these power series etcetera would all um, be entire functions, but they will blow up at infinity, they have bad behavior at infinity. Okay. Now, before we go on to the behavior uh, of power series, there is something else I wanted to mention and that is to ask what is the derivative of an analytic function. That is one more way of looking at the Cauchy Riemann conditions. 